Hello everybody, my name's Iona, I'm a registered dietitian and today I'll be talking you through the relationship between nutrition and heart health as part of your cardiac rehab. We'll also be joined by Cleo, our dietetic assistant, as we talk you through all of the topics that will be covered today. So, why talk about nutrition? Um, as you may already know, eating healthily can really help with one's heart health, particularly for reducing blood pressure and also just in decreasing the risk of coronary heart disease. Um, among other benefits of your health, um, it can also reduce your risk of diabetes and cause everything links in the body. There are some factors outside of diet that can influence your heart health. Um, some things may be within your control, such as your age or ethnicity, um, or they may be in your control, such as things like stress and physical activity within an extent. So today we're going to talk about nutrition because it's something that we can control um, and hopefully will help you on your journey for cardiac recovery. So how can diet affect our arteries? So as you can see in this diagram, we've got a nice healthy artery. Um, you can see there's no plaques within there. The artery wall's nice and wide, allowing plenty of blood to flow through without any disruption. And then we have an artery down here, which is quite often seen with diets as we have nowadays. It's quite high in saturated fats. It can lead to things called plaques forming in our arteries, and that narrows the artery, making it a lot harder for blood to travel as efficiently as it should. And that could increase your risk of high blood pressure, of um, sometimes clots forming in your arteries, and that's, of course, something we want to avoid. Um, an interesting point to raise, because I see it says normal artery here, but actually no one really has any arteries like this, apart from maybe newborn babies. Uh, we all have a bit of plaque to an extent in our arteries, but we want to keep it to a minimum uh, for the best health. So the topics we'll cover today include the Mediterranean diet, um, unsaturated fats, high fibre, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, low salt and alcohol in moderation. All of these things can impact your heart health in the long term. We'll also be talking about more specialist things such as plant stannols and sterols. You may have heard of them, you may not. Uh, weight and food labels as well. So I'm just going to introduce you to Cleo now who's going to talk you through the Mediterranean diet. Um, Okay, so I'm going to talk about the Mediterranean diet, which is a way of eating that is found in countries such as Spain, Greece, Turkey, south of France. And research has shown that it's very good at lowering the rates of heart attack, stroke and high cholesterol. The food in the Mediterranean diet focuses mainly on what you can see in these pictures, with an emphasis on lots of fruit and veg and whole grains, healthy oils, and fish. Um, it also features chicken and eggs, and less red meat, but it does have some red meat in, and low amounts of salt, and also alcohol in moderation. And on the next slide, we are gonna look at those foods in a little bit more detail. So as I said, a strong focus on fruit and vegetables, whole grains, vegetable oils, especially olive oil and rapeseed oil, unsalted nuts and seeds, and unsaturated fats. A moderate intake of low-fat dairy products, fish and poultry, and lower intake of processed foods, refined carbohydrates such as white bread, white pasta, cake, pastries, red meat, saturated fat, and salt. Right, now we're going to move on to fats. So, do we need fat in our diet? Yes, we absolutely do. So it's a really important part of making sure that we can make hormones. It also insulates our organs in the winter months so that we can survive the winter. And also it's important in just the building blocks of our cells uh, to make our bodies. So fat is absolutely essential, as well as 
certain vitamins are fat-based too. So by denying yourself fat, you'll be denying yourself these fat-soluble vitamins, which are also essential in our diets. So there's two main types of fat that we're going to talk about. Uh, so we've got saturated fats that you may have heard of, um, and these are what should be eaten less often uh, because they increase our so-called bad cholesterol, which is what causes those plaques in our arteries. Um, so examples of saturated fat generally include those that are solid at room temperature, be it butter or the fats around our red meats. Um, as Cleo outlined in a Mediterranean diet, it doesn't tend to feature so much saturated fat. Unsaturated fat, on the other hand, is the healthier choice because um, not only does it reduce our bad cholesterol, but it increases our good cholesterol. And the good cholesterol is what takes those plaques out of our arteries and puts it back into the liver where it belongs, really. And the liver can then use it to produce the things that we need it to produce. And unsaturated fats or sources of that tend to be things like avocados or vegetable oils and things that Cleo outlined when talking about the Mediterranean diet. So, as I just said, um, whereas the saturated and unsaturated fat found, so this goes into a bit more depth for your reference. Um, of course, these lists are not exhaustive and you may find that there are some exceptions to the rule. Um, for example, you can find some liquid coconut oils um, and although they're liquid at room temperature, they are still saturated fats. Um, whereas there are some saturated fats that are solid at room temperature that also reduce your cholesterol. An example of that being cocoa butter. Um, so although it's a saturated fat, it actually doesn't negatively affect our blood cholesterol, which is handy to know for us chocolate lovers out there. <laughs> so now we're going to talk about oily fish. Um, so oily fish is another source of an unsaturated fat and it's a specific type called omega-3 and this is really important for many aspects of our bodies. Um, for one thing it makes our skin nice and soft and supple but it also helps our heartbeats you know be more regular, um, it helps to prevent blood clots um, which would lead to strokes and heart attacks um, and will protect the arteries from damage as well. Um, these are the current sources of omega-3, um, so the evidence has recently changed, so unfortunately tuna no longer counts, um, but things like mackerel, pilchards or sardines, these are generally cheaper options. Um, you've got salmon, kippers, herring, trout, um, and these are the ones that we generally see sort of in the British seas that we can have access to. So our recommendations for oily fish. Um, so we'd say one portion a week, um, as per the Mediterranean diet. Um, and if you don't eat fish, there are some plant-based alternatives. Uh, some examples being flax seeds. Uh, so if you crush them up with a pestle and mortar, or you can buy them already crushed. Um, soya, rapeseed and olive oils. Uh, walnuts are a very popular option for vegans, um, as well as green leafy vegetables. Right, now I'll hand you back over to Cleo to talk you through fibre. Right, so now we are going to look at the topic of fibre. So, in a high fibre diet, um, this will contain at least 30 grams of fibre daily. And fibre is very good at reducing the risk of heart disease and lowering blood cholesterol. And it's particularly found in foods such as oats, fruit and vegetables, beans, pulses, peas, soya, lentils and chickpeas. So now we're going to look at a day of eating. What does 30 grams of fibre look like over a day? So if you were to have overnight oats for breakfast, in the raw porridge oats, this is 50 grams of raw porridge oats, 50 grams frozen raspberries, 100 grams of plain yogurt milk and 40 to 50 grams of nuts. Altogether, we've got 4 grams in the porridge oats, 1.3 grams in raspberries and 4 grams in the nuts. Then if you were to have a baked potato, 
for lunch. So a medium baked potato, which would weigh around 180 grams, that would have about five grams of fiber. 80 grams of baked beans would have three grams and tinned sweet corn, 80 grams of tinned sweet corn would have two grams. Then, of course, Mediterranean spaghetti, wholemeal spaghetti with pesto, 150 grams worth is six grams of fiber and broccoli and cherry tomatoes, 80 grams worth is two grams. And the snacks that this person had over the day were wholemeal toast with peanut butter, two slices, um, one tablespoon of peanut butter's worth, and a banana or apple, which is a medium size. You'd have eight grams altogether for the peanut butter and toast and two grams for the fruit. And in total, approximately 38 grams. So it's not too difficult with a bit of planning and a bit of foresight to meet your fibre recommendations. So now we're going to talk a bit about soya protein in particular. Um, some of you members of the audience may already have this in your diet, some of you might not. Um, and hopefully this slide will help you to consider maybe including it more if you don't already. So. There's a lot of evidence uh, to show that soya protein in particular uh, can reduce our risk of heart attacks. Um, it may be something to do with the phytoestrogens in it, or it could be to do with um, how it's a lean source of protein and it also has fiber in it. Um, either way, um, there's ways of making it quite palatable and a nice part of our meals. Um, so some examples include soya milk, or soy alternatives to dairy products. There's tofu, um, which can be very nice after a good marinade. And also soya beans, um, including edamame, uh, wasabi beans, um, as well as miso. That's also very flavoursome. Now we're going to go on to fruit and vegetables. Um, so I'm sure a lot of you in the audience would know how many portions of fruit and veg is recommended a day. I think we've all heard of the old five-a-day recommendation, and that is still what stands. Um, but if you can manage more than five a day, that is also spectacular. But what counts as a portion is something that we often don't tend to understand so much. So we'll go on to that in the next slide, um, as well as what counts as a portion for other food groups. Well, I'd like to talk about the benefits of fruit and vegetables. Um, so you may have already had this drummed into you, but they are an excellent source of fibre as well as vitamins. Um, and also they can taste very nice as part of an addition to a meal. And in terms of healthy eating, we always recommend adding more than taking. So whatever you'd usually have for your dinner, just adding an extra portion of fruit or vegetables um, before or after or during uh, would be a very healthy choice to make. So what counts as a portion size? So the general recommendation for fresh fruit is 80 grams, but we do not want people to get into the habit of weighing their food. It's not generally a healthy thing to do. Maybe on the odd occasion, just to give you an idea of what it looks like visually, um, but it's definitely not the best habit to have. So instead, what better way than our hands because all of our stomachs are different sizes unique to us so are our hands um, so a portion of fresh fruit and veg is however much will comfortably fit into our hands cut like this and then dried fruit about 30 grams would be however much dried fruit can comfortably fit into one hand um, as you can see this diagram lifted from the british heart foundation um, so if you can't see it clearly, feel free to go onto the British Heart Foundation portion sizes website and it's very nicely explained there. Um, but a portion of carbohydrate, ideally, should be about the size of your fist. Um, and I know what you're thinking, that's not very generous at all. Because um, if you think if you're going to have, say, some pasta for dinner, you're not just going to have the size of your fist. So you can have, say, two or three portions of carbohydrate as part of a meal, that's completely fine. Um, it's just a handy way to show how many portions of that particular food you tend to have a day to make up your diet, essentially. 
Also things like meat and beans, we'd recommend about the size of your palm. Um, and again, so if you're having some beans on toast, you're probably going to have two palms worth of beans and that's completely fine because that's what makes a meal, essentially. Um, then we have fish and chicken. Uh, because it's a lot leaner than meat, we can manage about double the size um, to make up one portion. Butter, we'd recommend the size of your finger or your thumb is what we'd aim for. Um, and cheese should ideally be two fingers um, to make up one portion. So, whole grains now. Um, so this is what we call the unrefined, unprocessed cereals. Um, and these can really reduce your risk of heart disease um, because of the fibre content, as we already discussed. Um, the best whole grains in particular to include in our diets are oats um, because it contains a particular type of fibre that helps lower our cholesterol. Um, but any form of fibre that you find most palatable is a really good thing to have in your diet. And it keeps us regular as well, which is also worth noting, I think. Um, so it's worth noting that the more refined and processed carbohydrates, such as white bread or sugary cereals or confectionery that contain lots of sugar, these don't provide fibre in your diet. Um, and therefore they don't provide the same cholesterol lowering benefits as the more whole grain forms of these foods. So it's better to go for the more whole grain versions. Now we're going to talk about salt. Um, so it is important to reduce the salt in your diet if you've been struggling with high blood pressure. Um, generally we'll recommend less than six grams of salt a day. So that makes up about a teaspoon of salt. Um, and you'll be surprised how much salt is actually in our food. I think you'll find, um, say, your allowance with bread, uh, quite often that'll take up most of your recommendation. Also things like ready meals tend to have a lot of added salt to make them taste better. Um, so please don't be deceived and always check the label, which we'll go on to later. Um, other foods that tend to be high in salt, um, which also taste quite salty, so it's easy to remember, is things like pizza and salami and bacon. Um, so it's better to have these either in smaller amounts or just less often. Um, so hopefully that gave you some inspiration as to how you can reduce the amount of salt in your diet. Um, other ways that maybe I'll mention on the slide is to choose lower salt options. Um, for example, things like stock. Um, quite often they sell a low salt version. I think be wary of things such as a lower salt mayonnaise, for example, because they can be higher in fat to compensate for the lack of flavour. So we'll talk about label reading shortly. Um, but if, if you've been advised to lower your salt in particular, then those are things that could be quite helpful. Right, right I'm going to hand you back over to Cleo to talk about alcohol. Okay, so now we're going to focus on alcohol. So, too much alcohol we know can damage the heart muscle and it can do things such as increase blood pressure, it can lead to weight gain and it can also increase cholesterol. So, because of that, the current recommendations are 14 units per week for both men and women spread evenly across the week so it wouldn't be the same to have 14 units all together in one session it would be much healthier to spread it out across the week so we're gonna do a little quiz we're gonna guess the units and calories so this is a glass of wine and So 250 millilitres of a glass of wine. How many units do you think are in 250 millilitres of a glass of red wine? Three units. <laughs> Three units, someone's just shouted out. Let's see if that's right. Yes! Three units. And three units equals... 
211 calories, so it's really helpful to know how many calories are in alcohol. So, double vodka and cola. How many units do we think is in a double vodka and cola? Two units! <laughs> Two, someone's just shouted out. Yeah! Two units are in a double vodka and cola. And that equals 168 calories. Oh! Big pint of, I think, lager, that is. So, one pint of lager. How many units do we think are in a pint of lager? Depends on the strength. <laughs> Depends on the strength. Oh, it's 5% strength. So, how many units are in a 5% strength? Three units. Three, we think. Oh, my goodness. This mystery person knows their units of alcohol. Thank you very much. And that equals 180 calories. So, now we're going to talk about plant stanols and sterols. It's more commonly known as Benicol or Proactive. And there's also uh, supermarket own brand versions too, which makes it a lot more affordable. So, plant stanols and sterols um, are found naturally in plants in very, very small amounts. Uh, so, you'd actually... <laughs> I have to do quite a lot of, um, I believe when I researched it, it was about a kilo of raspberries would be the equivalent of one uh, yogurt drink of plant stanols. So it's, they do exist in nature, but in very small amounts. And what they do is they reduce our cholesterol by preventing foods that have high saturated fat by being absorbed so much in the gut. Um, and that's how it reduces our cholesterol in the blood. So how do we use this very handy tool? So if you have around about two grams of plant stanols a day, um, that can reduce your cholesterol by about seven to ten percent. So as we explain here, this isn't a substitute for um, taking statins um, because seven to ten percent from a medicine perspective isn't an awful lot. However, if your doctor has tasked you with trying to reduce your cholesterol by diet alone and you're struggling just to get it that little bit lower, this is a really handy tool to do on top of your healthy Mediterranean style diet to get your cholesterol levels that little bit lower. Um, so generally speaking, uh, the recommended amount would be one of the yogurt drinks a day or two or three servings of this spread. Um, so there's no need to have both, like one or the other is completely fine. Um, and if you started having, say, two yogurt drinks a day, that's not going to reduce your cholesterol by 20%. It's only up to 10% is how effective it can be. Um, if you are considering not taking your statins or any other medication um, any longer, please um, consult your doctor and do not take these as a substitute. This is only on top of a healthy, low saturated fat diet, such as a Mediterranean diet. So what about our weights? So it's not so much what you weigh, it's where the weight goes in terms of your risk of heart disease. Um, so generally speaking, if you have more of an apple-shaped physique, meaning most of your weight is stored above the torso, then you're at a higher risk versus pear shape, where most of it's stored around your thighs, for example. So it tends to be women who have this shape, it tends to be men who have the apple shape, um, which is why men are at a higher risk of um, heart disease. Um, so it's not something we can really control um, a lot of the time, um, but it's something that's important to take note of. Um, but generally the focus is on your diet choices, um, much more than what the scales say. All right. Now we're going to go on to food labels. Um, so here's a classic example of a food label. Sometimes it's set out nicely with the traffic light system. Uh, sometimes it's a nice pie chart, or sometimes it's a nasty grid that's really hard to find on the label. 
All right. So we're going to go into more depth as to what these mean. Thankfully for us, it breaks it down into what's fat and what's saturated. Um, so generally speaking, if something's high in fat, but very low in saturated fat, that means it's high in unsaturated fat, which means it's healthier choice. So how do we read these red and orange and green labels? So it's done per 100 grams, which is why it can be quite tricky to interpret. Um, because certain foods we would have in a 100 gram serving, whereas other foods we wouldn't. Um, an example of this would be um, mayonnaise, for example. Even a low-fat mayonnaise will likely fall into the red category for fat, um, which means it is a healthier choice compared to the high-fat mayonnaise, um, but it doesn't mean that it's low in fat. Therefore, it's important to just use it as you normally would and not to go nuts on the serving just because it's lower in fat, uh, because it's still objectively high in fat. Right, so now we've got a quiz. So I'm going to ask you guys to guess what has the highest saturated fat content. Is it 100 grams of Greek natural yogurt or is it 100 grams of vanilla ice cream? Is it Greek natural yogurt? Strangely enough, yes, it is. Uh, so Greek natural yogurt only has a tiny amount more saturated fat than vanilla ice cream has. Now, you may think that Greek natural yogurt is a healthier choice. Um, some of you might know why that might be. And the reason being is because it contains a lot more nutrition than vanilla ice cream would. So Greek yogurt has lots of protein and calcium, whereas vanilla ice cream is full of sugar and not so much protein. So if you are going to indulge in something nice and creamy, um, Greek natural yogurt would be the better choice. However, if you're focusing solely on your saturated fat intake, and if you'd much rather the taste of vanilla ice cream, and you intend to only have, a, you know, if you intend to be mindful of the portion size, then sometimes vanilla ice cream can work out to be the healthier choice. Nutrition is very confusing. <laughs> Now, which has the highest saturated fat content? Is it creamy coleslaw or is it creamy rice pudding? Creamy rice pudding. Correct. Um, the reason being, although creamy coleslaw is full of mayonnaise, ultimately coleslaw is mostly raw cabbage, so that doesn't have much saturated fat in it. So, I'm gonna hand you over to Cleo uh, to give you a summary. So I'm just going to very quickly go through the summary of everything that we've focused on and spoken about for this session. So we looked at consuming a Mediterranean style diet from all the different countries around the Mediterranean area. We want to try and focus on decreasing an intake of saturated fats and replace with those unsaturated fats. We want to try and increase our fruit and vegetable intake, so try and think about some of your favourite fruits, favourite vegetables. We want to also increase our intake of whole grains and reduce processed carbohydrates, such as white bread, and free sugars, such as biscuits, cake, and fizzy drinks. We also want to choose more unsaturated fats and omega-3, we want to increase our fibre intake and we want to limit salt to 6 grams daily. We want to try thinking about drinking alcohol in moderation with some alcohol free days in between and try to maintain a healthy weight by making those healthier lifestyle choices. Okay, and we just want to say thank you very much for listening and we hope that it's been an informative talk. And if you have any further questions, you can speak to the cardiac team and they can direct questions to the dietitians. Thank you very much for listening.